So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for stopping by and coming to this workshop. Uh, we'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Brenda O'Neill, the Dean of the FPA. So I'm going to read her bio, but Brenda O'Neill okay. was appointed. Sorry. No, Do you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I got sent your bio. I know it's always the most awkward thing. <laughs> So Brenda Neal was appointed as Dean of the Faculty of Public Affairs in October, on October 1st, 2020. She also holds a position as professor in the Department of Political Science. Her research addresses several topics, including political behavior and gender and politics, focused largely on Canada. Her most recent research has examined gender and party leadership and the role of feminist identification in shaping support for Sovereignty Among Women in Quebec. She has held several shirt grants and recently held the Thelma Margaret Hort Fellowship in Women and Society at the University of Calgary. Between 2017 to 2020, she served as English language editor of the Canadian Journal of Political Science. Thank you so much for being here and introducing us. Thank you. Uh... Professor McKnight, but I'm going to call you Steffi. Yes. And, uh, thanks to you and to Julia Chan for all your hard work in bringing this important event together. I think it's a it's a pleasure for me to be asked to welcome everyone today to the to the workshop. Before I begin, though, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that Carleton University is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Although I think we might be attending from different locations, I think it nevertheless remains important for us to recognize the traditional Indigenous lands on which we reside. So the topic for today's workshop is inspiring in its innovativeness. I mean, research creation combines creative and academic research practices through artistic expression in a variety of art forms. We're able to further our understanding of interdisciplinary scholarly work. And I think this is, as I said, this is so innovative. Uh, through performances, satirical videos, and a podcast, Cam Hunters seeks to reveal and interrogate the presence of surveillance in all its forms in our lives. So these two artists slash scholars offer a unique way to look at the increasing presence of that surveillance in Airbnbs in particular, but in other forms, including individual citizens recording events on their smartphones for social media. This practice-based research allows for a new way of sharing and increasing knowledge using art practice, theoretical concepts, and scholarly research. It's this merging of these two elements that I find so innovative. So art and research then are not always separate entities. And together, Steffi McKnight and Julia Chan engage scholars, and I think the public alike, in, on key ethical, political, social, cultural issues, like really important issues in today's world. And these research connections are made between media, technology, art, and culture. So I think this, this research creation has such a significant potential in the academy. And it's for this reason that the Dean's Office in the Faculty of Public Affairs has lent its support to this particular research project. Professor McKnight has also created Proto Hive, a Carlton hub for communication, where creative researchers are able to share their ideas, their insights and resources, to ask questions about research ethics, and to come together to discuss their work. So, Embedded in all of this is a sort of form of communication. Today's event is part of the PA research series, an ongoing celebration of the diversity of research that's produced in the Faculty of Public Affairs. We have a, a whole set of events taking place this month. Uh, later this week, we have the FPA Research Excellence Award Public Lecture by political science professor Bill Cross, uh, William Cross. He'll be talking about who is the political party in trying to understand the complexity of the actors involved in political parties in their different roles. So you can visit carlton.ca slash FPA slash events to get more information about these uh, different events. Again, thank you to Stephanie McKnight and Julia Chan on your research into surveillance that's presented today's workshop through Cam Hunters. Your research is important and integral to the mission of the Faculty of Public Affairs, which is big and yet I think important to help build better societies and stronger democracies, to address regional and global challenges and to enhance and inform public discussion. So thank you for inviting me to introduce you today and to welcome everybody to the workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna share my screen. <laughs> Oh, 
So thanks so much um, for inviting us to speak and for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm just gonna run quickly through um, the structure of today's workshop. Um, first, we're gonna start with uh, some introductions. We started with that already, and then Steffi and I are gonna introduce ourselves and, and talk a little bit about what Camp Hunters is. Um, and then we're going to show uh, our first video, which is nine minutes long. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of our other projects, um, including uh, a podcast. We'll play a little snippet from that and uh, another snippet from uh, a, another video that we made. We'll talk about um, this concept of disruptive exhibitionism that we've kind of come up with as, as a way to kind of think through what we're doing. Um, we'll talk about some critical tools that we're making, and then um, we will go through some ways for you to incorporate research creation into your own um, your own um, practice. And then I, I, we're gonna ask you to hold all your questions until the end or put your questions into the chat. And um, we, will, we will come to them at the end of the, of the session so we don't run out of time. Okay, so I'm up first. So my name is Julia Chan and um, I am uh, a mixed race settler living in Toronto, also known as Toronto. Um, I have long dark hair and light skin and I'm wearing um, glasses and I'm also wearing a hat. It's a, it's a black um, baseball cap with this little logo that Steffi designed for Cam Hunters and it's a it's a camera, it's a, it's a camera, what's, what's the word for the, the shutter? Camera it's shutter. camera shutter in um, crosshairs. So goes with our, our, with the name of our project, Cam Hunters. So currently I am a postdoctoral fellow here at Carleton University um, in the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice. And I'm also a course instructor. I'm currently teaching a course on images, crime and violence. Um, I recently completed a, my first postdoctoral fellowship at York University in cinema and media studies. My research um, is broadly concerned with image-based sexual abuse and its relationship to cinematic and uh, surveillance cultures. And uh, current, my current research project here at Carleton is examining discourses around the, um, the looker or the perpetrator of image-based sexual abuse and the, imp the implications of that discourse for um, policy and legal responses. So my name is Stephanie McKnight. Uh, I go by Steffi. I am a white settler artist scholar based in Cataraqui, Kingston, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. And I uh, have long, dark brown hair. I'm also wearing the same hat as Julia described, a black baseball cap with the Cam Hunters logo. Uh, I am also, I am white skinned, I am wearing glasses and my background is purple with many different picture frames of Pokemon cards <laughs> and a plant. Um, I have a PhD in cultural studies where alongside Julia, that's how we met. And uh, my work explores surveillance as a contemporary form of colonialism in Canada. And uh, it's actually quite broad. I look at surveillance in rural areas, specifically in Northern Ontario, but my research is rooted in research creation as a methodology for knowledge production. So as uh, Dr. O'Neill has already alluded to, I focus mainly on research creation as a research practice, and I use uh, it, it to talk about contemporary events such as surveillance, uh, queerness, uh, and policies and political events that we may be familiar with. Uh, I also am a rural camp specialist, uh, part of our duo. So we have, we'll talk about this a little bit later, what our, our specialties are. And uh, I am super excited to be here. That's pretty much everything that's really exciting about me. Oh, I'm an assistant professor at the, in the Bachelor of Media Production Design. That's the, that's the key important one I was trying to remember there. My job, my day job, what do I do? Uh, I'm in Cam Hunters mode. I'm only thinking Cam Hunters. That's our, <laughs> thanks, <Julie. laughs> All right. So what is Cam Hunters? Um, Cam Hunters is a collaborative art, media, performance, and research creation project between um, 
me and Steffi. Cam Hunters seeks to reveal and interrogate uh, the increasing presence of surveillance in all its forms in our lives. And we do this through a range of projects such as performances, creating satirical videos, uh, recording a podcast and offering critical tools. And um, we are available for consultations, performances and exhibitions. And as you can see uh, down at the bottom, our slogan is vigilance is the new black. So initially it began as one um, collaborative satirical video that Steffi and I made together. And then it slowly kind of grew into a larger collaboration with multiple projects, each of which we'll run through briefly today. Um, and it started with a, a kind of mutual interest in surveillance. Both Steffi and I, um, during our doctorates had studied surveillance in different ways. And we also had our own creative practices and we always kind of wanted to find a way to, to work together. Um, so um, we ended up coming together to create this first video, which came out of my research on image-based sexual abuse. I, as I was researching, I found, I kept finding articles about um, how to protect yourself from hidden cameras in Airbnbs. So um, in the last few years, there had been reports of people um, in many different countries finding hidden cameras or surveillance cameras that they were not initially aware of inside the properties that they were, were renting that weren't initially disclosed to them. Um, some of these cameras were um, found in you know, common areas like living rooms and, and were meant to be for ostensibly for security reasons. And some of them were in more private spaces like bathrooms and, and bedrooms and, and you know, clearly were for more pr prurient reasons. Um, so Airbnb did develop a policy on this, um, stating that owners or renters, I forget what, the hosts, that's it, hosts need to disclose any cameras they have on the property, whether they're turned on or not. Um, guests also need to disclose whether or not they're putting cameras inside, like using cameras inside. Um, and uh, Airbnb encouraged users to uh, use their messaging feature to ask hosts about the presence of cameras. So anyway, we came across all these articles with tips on how to pr protect yourself um, from, find from these cameras. And it just struck us this, that there was this very strange and absurd tension between, you know, being ostensibly, you know, you're on vacation, it's, it's a pleasurable time, and this need to kind of protect yourself from invasive camera technologies. Um, and some articles posited this as this new normal, right, that it's just um, a given now that you should sweep your Airbnb rental for cameras. Um, so some of the tips ran from like very simple things like checking, you know, things that look odd, um, or maybe appear to be out of place, um, testing for one-way mirrors, um, to more involved things like downloading apps that that claim to be able to detect cameras, Wi-Fi cameras, and even hiring a professional to sweep your your property before you kind of move in. <laughs> um, and we were also really struck by this kind of the sort of neoliberal bent of the articles, right? So this this sense of like having to download the management of this risk of being surveilled onto the individual and then tasking them with having to root these cameras out um, in order to enjoy yourself fully on vacation. So we kind of, you know, we're talking about this and this like came up with this idea of, of cam hunters, you know, people you might hire to um, sweep your space for a camera. And we thought about making this sort of satirical how-to video based on some of these suggestions. Um, so I'm going to show that video now. And I apologize, there are no um, subtitles. I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. I think okay. if we watch it off, oh yeah, we mentioned Vimeo would have bad quality, but we could. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to show the actual, um, actual file. It's nine minutes long. So I just entered one of the cutest Airbnbs I have ever been to. They've got these bells on the door, this little plant. So what we're looking at are the ways that Airbnb property owners may install surveillance cameras in their properties, in their homes, and in their bedrooms to surveil their renters, either for damages, theft, or for whatever other creepy reasons 
there are out there. But I have full confidence in this couple. They have great reviews. They're super hosts. That's one of the most important things. They have great communications with me. But, you know, you can never be too careful. One of the biggest recommendations that news and media outlets, as well as experts, and we suggest uh, following is that you do a lot of research in the Airbnb and the location in which you're thinking of renting in. So thinking about the, the host, are they super hosts? Do they have great reviews? Do they have bad reviews? Has somebody commented that they've found a camera in the past? Are there news articles circulating about incidences where people have found cameras in their Airbnbs around that area? Ask questions, ask others if they've stayed there and be familiar with the place and have communication with the host before you do rent. These will promote some of these conversations before getting into the space. So there was um, a reporting that there were cameras found in alarm clocks and uh, specifically a, a couple in Toronto. So we have this alarm clock here. Um, and actually it doesn't even look like it's working. But if we take it apart, uh, there's batteries. Maybe the batteries are just dead. Yeah, it doesn't really seem like there's any way to have a camera that is apparent. Uh, it looks like a pretty cheap alarm clock. Uh, and then one of the other recommendations is to shine your cell phone flashlight. And if there's anything sparkling uh, in the darkness, you'll be able to find it. But um, on my cell phone, I can't record and take flashlight at the same time. So there's this flashlight here that uh, they've left. And uh, it's one of those like little northern flashlights. It's pretty bright. So let's see if there's any like reflection. If there's anything sparkly. So what you want to be a little bit more aware of. Anything shining in abnormal places. This little weird looking elephant over here. Anything hidden within this television?
So one of the things that we found is that if you put your finger onto a mirror to check if it's a double-sided mirror and if there's someone watching on their side, that if you put your finger on the mirror and you see a that there is no space and your two fingers are touching, so the reflection and your finger are touching, then that means that there is the potential of uh, another person or another room on the other looking into the space. There is a nice little bathroom. Very cute. Cute little window, set up, shower, light. Toilet, oh, there's some, you know, hidden areas to hide things in. Nothing really in there. Really nothing. Hello. Uh, they have these pot lights. They're a little bit inaccessible to get to, so I'm not sure how to find anything there. I'm not quite sure what else I should be looking for in here, so this place looks pretty legit. Back to my screen share here. So we shot and edited that in 2018. And um, some of the footage we shot separately and some of it we shot together. And we wanted to, we used, we filmed it exclusively on our phones because we wanted that kind of gritty DIY um, amateur kind of aesthetic, in part because that kind of aesthetic really, um, well, it, I think it's subject, suggestive of like sort of hidden camera and later, lateral surveillance, you know, that idea of the rougher the image, the more um, authentic or real it is. Um, so that's that project. And now I'm going to hand it over to Steffi to talk about um, a couple of our next um, 
we go. Great. Uh, every time I watch that video, I just think of how amateur it really is <laughs> and how we purposely aimed it for that uh, just because of the the reality like J Julia just said about going out and looking with cameras because most people who are traveling don't have like massive uh, technology so that they can do that work so uh, it's it's actually really funny to me and I just I had my mic off and I just keep laughing because it's kind of embarrassing <laughs> But it's cute. Um, so in terms of disruptive exhibitionism, this is a, a theme, uh, an idea, a methodology that Julia and I discussed uh, during a writing retreat a couple years ago. We were just sitting in this beautiful cabin, uh, throwing around ideas. I was writing a chapter for my dissertation and she was as well. And we were, were both really interested in the idea of empowering exhibitionism by Hilly Koskela. And uh, this is really well known in surveillance studies. And the, the general premise of it is that people use video surveillance mechanisms like reality television, uh, mobile phones, apps to reclaim empowerment and that they're not using it necessarily for threat or that they're using it to surveil, but they're actually using it as a form of uh, counter surveillance onto themselves so that they can feel empowered and reclaim their bodies in a surveillance state. But one of the issues that we've seen with that text is that they don't actually talk much about the complexities of race. Uh, BIPOC and queer bodies within the idea of empowering exhibitionism, and it was mostly centered towards reality television stars, which happened to be white when the article uh, was published in 2004. And then there's the idea of counter exhibitionism, which is something very uh, that has been shared by Mirzov, and the idea of counter visualization as using images and text to reclaim again power uh, either by BIPOC people who would like to use protest images or uh, cameras so that they can feel empowered. So there was an interesting example here between two similar methodologies uh, that didn't necessarily speak to one another, but also could work well together. And uh, while I was writing my dissertation, I was using the theory of countervisuality, but I was using it in retrospect to an article uh, created by Torin Monahan that was written about surveillance art specifically by white producers who were trying to achieve countervisuality, but couldn't fully because their work still privileged the white bodies. And in that article, he explains that there are ways in which us white people could create that work. And the examples that he was giving was being an ally or going to protest. And that really was hard for me to hear because I realized that although it tried to challenge privilege, it didn't get to the full extent that uh, I, as a white person, can decide which protest I attend, uh, that I can't claim to be an ally. Allyship is not something that can be self-possessed. Uh, you can't just claim that you're an ally and that you are, uh, that your work has to be recognized or that it actually is done. And it's possible that you might be an ally in one regard, but that you're not fully an ally in the other. So for myself, at least, uh, as a white scholar, I found that these two types of theories, although we're getting at a little bit of the crux of the importance of trying to be disruptive when it comes to surveillance, that it didn't fully get to that point, that there wasn't a guideline for white artists to produce work that would disrupt surveillance in a way that also acknowledged the complexities and the marginalization of BIPOC folk. And I think further to that, one of the things that I always thought about is how do white people create artwork or research creation that doesn't necessarily center their privilege, if that's even possible? And how do the objects we create are in themselves colonial objects because we have the institutions and privilege to create them. So 
that was really where disruptive exhibitionism came to be it was the merging of those two theories in a way that really got to the point of how do we talk about surveillance as not only an event but also as a methodology the power of surveillance and the ways in which we can use surveillance to be to not only complicate events but also think about ourselves as being embedded in surveillance so as myself as a white person what does it mean for me to be in a world where surveillance benefits me uh, and how do I actually engage and participate in different forms of policing, just being out in the world and by creating and by making these objects that get circulated and have privilege in the spaces in which they're circulated. So that was really where we came up with that idea. Um, and that really led, I would say, to our probably our more critical work that led to the podcast and uh, as Julia will talk about later, the tools that we were really, we started by this satirical kind of Airbnbs look at everything. Everybody can be a victim of Airbnb surveillance and then became a lot more aware and uh, complicated what it is to be an actual agent in the surveillance world and also participated in. So I'm going to show a little clip. We're going to just listen to a little clip of the podcast. Uh, the first podcast, there's eight, there's a season. And uh, let me just grab it up here. The season has, as I mentioned, eight episodes and then one introductory episode. So there's technically nine. And the first real episode that we did was on COVID-19 life on camera. So this was actually pretty much at, I think it came out this podcast, maybe in, I'm going to say like April or May. So it was pretty much at the point where COVID was still fairly new and really impacting labor, specifically labor of sex workers in Canada. So I'm going to play a few minutes of this podcast for all of you. Uh, I will have to share my screen for that. And you should be able to hear the sound as well. Hey, Cam Hunters, we want to take this opportunity to express our solidarity with the Black Lives Matter protests that have been occurring around the world. And also to encourage our listeners. Sorry about that. I think it's picking up on my should, I need to, um, I think if you're muted, we can't hear. And around the world, Got it. including blacklivesmatter.ca, the Toronto Protester Bail Fund, Justice for Regis, the George Floyd Memorial Fund, the Black Legal Action Center, the Black Health Alliance, and the Black Artist Network and Dialogue. We will include these and more links on our website on the podcast page, camhunters.org slash podcast. Welcome back. This is the first episode of Cam Hunters, the podcast. I'm Steffi. And I'm Julia. And I think we're going to get right into it. Mm -hmm. Julia's going to start off today with uh, a great story for all of you. Um, so I came across a, a really interesting website post um, called A Guide to Coping with Quarantine as a Survivor of Digital Violence. Um, and so this post was on a, a law firm's website. The law firm is called CA Goldberg. And the lawyer, <clears throat> the head lawyer or what, what's the name of what do you call a lawyer who's like the, the head of the firm there's a term for that anyway um the head lawyer. any fans of any what's that lawyer show that everybody watches suits mm, 
yeah, I don't the know. Harvey, the Harvey of the of the place. Okay. Um, anyway, the the main the head lawyer, um, Carrie Goldberg, specializes in helping victim survivors of, of digital violence, and she herself is actually a victim survivor as well. And uh, her story is told in a really interesting documentary from 2018 called Netizens, which I encourage. Um, I encourage you to check out if you're interested. Um, so the subtitle of the of the web the web post is the question: How do you cope with being forced to move your entire world onto a device when your device was a vehicle for abuse? Mm. So, in other words, how does one cope with having to be or 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 being more being expected to be more online and more on camera than ever before. And so we're recording this podcast um, episode in the middle of the COVID-19 global pandemic, where many of us are, are currently living in lockdown. And if we're lucky, doing our jobs from home. Um, and so a lot of us are being asked or even required to spend a lot of time on platforms like Zoom or Skype or FaceTime and so on. So much time on mm -hmm. Zoom. Yeah, and I mean, whether it's for work or um, with your friends or family, um, th this is one of the main ways that we are now communicating. Um, but if you've been traumatized as a result of being recorded or imaged against your will, or if you've had recordings or images of yourself circulated publicly against your will, how do you navigate what everybody is now calling this new normal? And so, um, I see image-based sexual abuse as a form of surveillance. So this was uh, my dissertation work. Um, and so if we define surveillance as a kind of concentrated watching with the intent to somehow affect the person that you're watching, I would argue that image-based abuse certainly falls into that category because essentially you're watching or using some kind of concentrated attention on images as a way to infi inflict um, pain or abuse on somebody else. So it makes perfect sense that people who've been, or people who've experienced this kind of abuse may not want to be on camera, may not want to be recorded. They may feel um, as if this sense of like a lack of control that they could be made public um, against their will. And so being asked to be uh, constantly on camera can be triggering or even re-traumatizing. So the post, um, and we'll, we'll include the, the link to the post in our show notes. Um, the post gives some tips for dealing with this new normal and um, what really caught my attention um, in the list of tips was the final tip, which was get camera consent. Uh, so I'll read from that paragraph. It says, practice affirmative camera consent. If you feel comfortable with being on video, then by all means do it. Know that you have a choice right now and feel free to exercise that choice with your employer and all the ways the world is asking you to connect. Ask others if they feel comfortable with being on video so we don't feel like we always have to bring it up. Also, people like to take pictures of virtual meetings happening and post them on social media. Ask the people on your video calls for their consent before. Even if we're on video with you, do not assume we are giving you consent to take our picture or record us. If I didn't tell you it's okay, do not assume it is. So I Googled the phrase affirmative camera consent um, because I'd never heard that before. And um, I was curious to see if this, it, it, if it was a term that people were now kind of using. Um, and the main two sources I found were this article that I'm quoting and um, various quotations from a therapist named Francesca Rossi, who uh, specializes in digital violence. And so I find this idea really interesting because even before this pandemic, there had been this creeping sense, at least from my perspective, of everything being recorded. So you go to talks and they were recording with a video camera or an audio recorder. Mm -hmm. Um, you go to a party or a gathering and someone's taking pictures and putting them up on Facebook or you're on the street and a cyclist passes you with a camera on their helmet or cars go by with dashboard cams and of course, um, you know, CCTV cameras, which are everywhere as well. So, it so I'm going to stop it there um, and I'm going to stop sharing, but that was essentially a clip of what it looks like. Uh, we we have eight episodes. They're all available on SoundCloud and Apple iTunes. The goal of the podcast really is to juxtapose the creation element and the theory and surveillance studies. But also it was at a time where Julia and I, you know, we just got into lockdown and we're thinking about how do we collaborate as research creationists from two separate cities uh, that we can't actually be in the same space. So this is an example of ways that we can get 
scholars from uh, across different geographies to come together and do something creative. Uh, so that was really what the podcast aimed to do. In terms of the other projects that we had on the go, we also started an unboxing video kind of stream. We haven't done very many of them because the unboxing video that we worked on, <laughs> Julia was at my place for a weekend and literally the day she left, COVID pretty much ended the weekend or started the ending. We were all in lockdown pretty much the weekend after she left. So that was the last time that Julia and I have been in a space together and able to work. So the uses of creative tools that she's going to talk about and the podcast were a way that we can still keep going and do this important work, but from a distance. So Julia, do you want to play the unboxing video from your camera or from your place? Yes, I will. And we're only going to show a clip of this as well. Yeah, we're only going to show a little bit of it. Um, they're all, all of these are available on our website, uh, camphunters.org. So if you want to see anything, uh, listen to the podcast fully or watch this video fully. It's pretty much where we update everything as it go, comes along. So I'll show a few minutes from the beginning and then I'll skip to a little bit later and a, a few minutes of that and then um, we'll move on from there. <laughs> Start laughing. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to interrupt to say, in case you're not familiar with what unboxing videos are, they are a genre on YouTube, um, which is where somebody receives something or buys something and they open it up for the first time on camera and and kind of talk their way through their their reactions. So I we should have said that at the beginning. Welcome to uh, the first uh, unboxing episode of uh, Cam Hunters. Um, my name is Julia and I'm Steffi. This is Steffi. And we, we have a, a spy school sneaky surveillance kit. Um, Julia got this for me for my birthday. Yes. What a lovely human. Thank you. You're Julia. welcome. Um, so we thought this was a very interesting um, piece of. Um, this is a toy for children. So if you're watching um, and you want to tweet about it as you're watching, you can use the hashtag spy school sneaky surveillance uh, because that, that's provided on the box for um, people who There's are There's also to YouTube and Facebook this. links. So if you would like to uh, follow what other people are doing, uh, it's uh, eight plus. It's just eight plus, yes. There's a lot of pieces. Uh, it's made by Smart Lab. I I came across this in a in a store. It was like a um, a store that had mostly like um, stationery and art supplies, but there's also like a fairly large section of um, toys for kids. I saw this and I immediately was struck by it because mm -hmm. um, I just I I I don't I never really thought about surveillance as a toy before, um, but you know. Clearly, it, it is, or it can be. All right, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. And I mean, I guess that we can talk about this practice as, again, like getting them ready and used to the current surveillance culture, yes. and the ways in which it's ubiquitously situated in our lives. Welcome. We at Breck Industries have had our eye on you for a long time now. Your second grade teacher, the crossing guard, your dentist, they're all Breck agents skilled at identifying kids who have what it takes to join the ranks of Breck. Our goal at Breck is to create a force of spies who will use their talents to help the world. Okay, okay, so this is, you know, meant to be used for good. The Breck Industry Spy School is our way of developing new spies like you. This, this is giving me chills. <laughs> this book is your introduction to spycraft. In its pages, you will find tips, tricks, and missions, all designed to train you to become the best and the most good spy you can be. The best and the most good. Are they trying to sort of say, like, you'd be the best spy, but you're also a good spy? Is there such thing as a good spy? 
I don't know. Is there, I mean, it's I guess that's a question. question. Like, who you're spying on and who's the surveillance? Like, who are you spying on and why? Who has uh, the privilege of who gets to watch you? Well, I was just recently rereading um, 1984. Okay. There is like the spies, right? And the spies are children. Um, and they're like a group, they're like, a, it's almost like the scouts, right? The children are trained to spy on adults mm -hmm. and to uh, be ready to um, report or denounce them at any time. Um, and so, and, and this is held up as, as, a, as a, an important value, right? That yeah. to be a good spy is an important skill to have. And, there, and everybody is in sort of constant fear of being reported by the spies. All Breck agents follow the Breck code. Since you don't know who we are, find a mirror, look yourself squarely in the eye and repeat the code. Oh my goodness. I, state your name, promise to spy for good, never to harm or embarrass anyone. As a Breck agent, I will uphold the highest principles of honesty, honor, and oh, wholesomeness. crazy. That's like this idea of, you know, you're looking at like CSIS, so like the Canadian Security Intelligence Services, and it's like a building that has all of these windows. And you think that because of the windows that there's this idea of transparency and that mm -hmm. we're doing things for good, you know, we're inviting you, but you will never get in that building. Yeah. And uh, who is it who writes about the idea of the certain buildings with lighting? You can only see it at so much, right? Right. Like, because depending on the type of the day, the weather, you're not actually going to get to see in those buildings. So there's this false idea of transparency, mm -hmm. and that that's working through this idea of honesty and uh, of trust. But you never really know what's happening and how much information that's no. actually being collected. And because we it, know through research yeah. that it's not always the most ethical. So it's like it's a really interesting idea here of yeah. it's like ethics of yeah. Well, what is for gives us a good sense of that. So what I really like about the unboxing video is that we've used a method that we're a very popular method that is now all over YouTube. Uh, the unboxing, the getting to know the product, the showing of the product, but at the same time juxtaposing theory and actual scholarly input. And I think that that's what a really great example of what research creation does is it allows you to take methodologies from popular culture, popular ideas, social media, YouTube, etc., using it for not only to disseminate information, but also to create new knowledge in itself as we're using it. So as you saw through that video, Julie and I were going through the book, we were reading quotes, but also because of our backgrounds knew quite a bit about the academic or the scholarly implications of that and we're able to talk about something as mundane as a child's toy in the same way as people may write theoretical papers critiquing an object or a text or a, a toy uh, but we just were able to do it in a, a more creative method that also lends itself to this culture of unboxing that is happening so that's really the point of that with the unboxing, it also lends itself to movements towards merchandising and uh, certification and authenticity. So we also, and all again, all of this is supposed to be performative and uh, kind of like not a joke, but also just there's supposed to be some some lightness to this really heavy, uh, important work. So we created a certification system and essentially what it is, is you can email us and get a certificate that says that this Airbnb has been Cam Hunters approved as safe. So if you were to put that certificate on your wall, ideally people would be able to see it and think, okay, so there's no cameras here. Now, obviously these aren't real certifications. They don't hold any weight, but it's a way in which uh, people who are familiar with us could see that as a form of this, this place being uh, safe for 
and safe of voyeurism. But also, you know, if you were to be in a place with cameras and that certification being up, then you could say, well, hey, you told me that there are no cameras and now you're using it. So it kind of empowers that viewer or that user also. And uh, it also fits within the logo and merch. So we designed this logo as Julia has already explained, and then we put it on Society6 where people can buy merchandise. Now, funny, funnily, the weird part is that the logo resolution was never big enough to actually put it on t-shirts and such, and I'm in the process of fixing that, but the only stuff that the logo was able to fit on were things that you would buy for your home. So things as mundane as like a cutting board or uh, a serving tray, uh, a bath mat, coasters, these really ridiculous things that you probably would never care for the Cam Hunters logo to be on. But then we thought, wouldn't it be hilarious if somebody had an Airbnb and just bought all of those things and had our logo all over the Airbnb and it would become the space, this the safety space because they would know that that host would support Cam Hunters who is really trying to dismantle this voyeurism. Uh, and it would be another way of showing trust to those people who are going to be using those Airbnbs. Again, these are all like supposed to be uh, just some fun, lighthearted th ways of thinking about it, but it actually could, could actually be really important to people who have been victims or uh, who know about this form of surveillance in these domestic, private, semi-private public spaces. Uh, so Julia will have the next section. Yes. Oops. Critical tools. So. As you heard from that um, podcast snippet, with the pandemic came these questions of, you know, what does it mean to live your life more and more on camera? Um, and again, as um, as part of my research on image-based abuse, as I mentioned in the podcast, I came across that article about camera consent um, and the increasing expectation that people need to be available on Zoom and other video conferencing platforms and how that could affect people who um, have survived digital violence involving cameras and imaging. Um, and so we also began thinking about, well, how, how can this, you know, help ourselves and our colleagues navigate this kind of, you know, new, you know, new normal um, in a thoughtful and an ethical way, like thinking about how do, how might this affect people from different, you know, who have different life experiences and different positionalities. And so Steffi suggested the creation of a statement that people could use and adapt either for their syllabi um, or for their meetings. Um, and so we, we created this statement called the Statement on Declining Online Imaging. And basically, and it's available on our website if you're interested in, in looking at it and or adapting it and using it yourself. Um, and basically it's just a way of, of um, indicating to people that they don't necessarily need to um, you know, appear on camera if, if they are uncomfortable with it for whatever reason, you know, whether they're a member of a highly surveilled group, uh, whether they've survived um, um, digital abuse, uh, or, you know, home is not always a safe space for everyone, right? So um, all of these thoughts have kind of gone into making the statement and, and some of the, um, and we've included sort of a, a, a discussion as well in, in the PDF that's available online about the sort of thinking that goes on, um, that the thinking that went on behind it, um, as well as some um, ways of thinking about how to to um, be thoughtful with when working with people uh, online and students especially. So when you're in a position of power, it makes quite a difference. Um, and then finally, um, we are starting work on a book project. We're both really interested in this idea of surveillance and pleasure. Um, so we wanted to um, create an edited collection that would bring together um, um, academic thinkers, but also artists, people um, who work um, in um, surveillance studies, um, to think about surveillance as a form um, of empowering exhibitionism, as we talked about earlier, Hilly Koskala's 
um, concept of empowering exhibitionism, um, surveillance as desire and surveillance as entertainment. So examples could be like in our unboxing video, surveillance toys for children, um, could be social media applications, could be reality television, um, all these different ways that surveillance um, is part of our life and can be used in pleasurable ways. Um, so one of the main um, ideas that Steffi's going to talk about now um, is surveillance as a methodology and a practice. So rather than thinking about surveillance as only an event that happens, um, a, we can think maybe of surveillance more as a way of being in the world, as um, has been argued by someone whose name I forget. Oh my gosh, I'm so upset with myself. Anyway, that that's not my idea. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pass it on to Steffi. So to conclude uh, this talk and uh, kind of a workshop, this is more of the workshopping component uh, and uh, there are more suggestions and then we can talk about them in the Q&A, but I wanted to end this off with Julia to talk about how to include research creation and research. Because I think that there is still, although research creation is not new, it's been in Canada for about 15 years, it's internationally known for several years. It's a practice that I think is still very uh, difficult to grasp because institutions have yet to really implement it as a consistent methodology. So we're seeing it come up in certain programs and in certain departments, but it's not something that is used universally. And part of that is because research creation is often, if not mostly used by artists, media producers, musicians, uh, people in drama or theater, uh, media production, people in computer sciences. So people who do more of the creative or very production based research. And some of the ways in which, so I wrote a paper, uh, it was published, I believe, in the beginning of 2020 in the Surveillance of Society Journal, uh, Surveillance Society, Surveillance Society, sorry, my dog is currently at my door scratching to come in. Uh, uh, so one of the things that I've outlined in that paper was how to create artwork that don't only talk about research or don't only talk about surveillance, but in themselves are surveillance and use artwork as Julia said as methodology or surveillance as methodology. So some of that artwork includes incorporating cameras, surveillance cameras as the actual way of documenting things and then editing them. Uh, so using drones, uh, hunting cameras or as actual medium rather than just using them for what they were initially intended. So what this paper outlines are two of the three examples that I've given here to include research creation and surveillance studies, but that these can be applied to any discipline. So some of the most uh, use disciplines that are not art-based that use research creation are geography, sociology has been doing a lot of this, uh, community-based research. So any place that uses community-based research, there's a lot of different forms of research creation uh, in Indigenous studies, specifically with different ways of sharing knowledge, so oral traditions and walking and mapping. So the three, the three suggestions that I have for you moving forward after this talk is to think about collaboration as your first. So when I think about collaboration and when I've talked about collaboration in my paper, collaboration isn't only between artists or between humans and scholars, that collaboration can be between non-human animals. It can be between human and technology, human and land, and any form of transdisciplinary fields of study. So this might seem at surface value a little bit odd, um, but ideas of collaboration between human and non-human animals or human and land is actually very much uh, rooted from indigenous methodologies. So we see a lot of artists who create, indigenous artists who create work for the land or work that speaks to the land or with the land. And uh, the point here is not to appropriate those methodologies, but to, inc 
to uh, acknowledge them as forms of knowledge production as well. So that we're not discounting collaboration uh, as a form of knowledge production because research creation is not actually traditional. Uh, it often fights tradition in the academy. Um, the second is function creep methodologies and ideas. So this is borrowing specifically from surveillance studies, communi uh, communication studies, law, and uh, computer and sciences. So function creep at surface value is usually when you take an object or a technology and you creep it or you change its use for something beyond its original intent. So an example of function creep that I always give to people is when you're thinking about your driver's license. Initially, a driver's license was created specifically so that people knew that you had the ability to drive and that you were licensed to drive. With time, it's become our primary method of ID. So if you're going to go to purchase alcohol, if you're going to go to a bar, or if you're going to go uh, take out a loan or a credit card, you need your driver's license. That is your primary method of ID. And that's an example of function creeping its original intent of creation. So some of the ways in which uh, research creationists might use function creep is using uh, as I mentioned, technologies like hunting cameras that have a very specific purpose to capture uh, animals for art production, or using um, any type of found object and twisting it on its head. So if you're thinking about critiquing an object and its usage, using research creation allows you to take that object, do something creative with it that still critiques its function, but will critique it by doing something different than what it was originally intended for. And then it's to manipulate those objects to make new objects and new knowledges out of it. Finally, for those of you who might be more interested in geography or in space or um, in any form of storytelling, Mapping spaces and research is very much embedded in research creation as well. And we're seeing a lot of this, as I mentioned, in geography, people using Esri and Argus as story map telling. So using community-based research, grabbing that knowledge from communities and using community uh, collaboration to put stories online through maps or to start mapping out uh, very specific areas of knowledge. So we've, we're seeing more and more maps today uh, of communities mapping out trees, uh, trees that have been impacted by uh, the Emerald Ash Borer or invasive species. And you'll see these maps on, on city sites that have all the locations of those infected trees. And that's a way of, of including research with creative methodologies like mapping. So these are some of the suggestions that I suggest if you were to include research creation in your practice, but also acknowledging that uh, research creation is very much heavily rooted in the fine arts and in art. So it's not something that I would suggest that you just go out and do, but that you also incorporate artists in your, produ in your production and you start collaborating with people who you may not have considered uh, academics before. And these are not only artists in academia, but also artists who might do uh, community-based research on their own in the world or in their communities. And uh, collaborating with people who may not be in the institution and may not have the privilege to be in the institution. So again, at its core, it's really trying to dismantle uh, neoliberal, traditional fields of knowledge production to include people and objects and entities that may not have access to these spaces. So that's pretty much how I want to conclude that kind of section. Julia, do you have any thoughts before we, we open to questions? You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, I don't have anything to add. That's great. Thank you. And um, but I did remember the name of the uh, scholar whose, whose name I couldn't remember, Jonathan Finn. Um, his article is Seeing Surveillantly. So if any of you are interested in this idea of um, 
seeing the world through surveillance um, as, a, as a kind of way of living or a way of seeing, then that's an interesting article to read. He has a great book on capturing the mugshot. Uh, so also looking at uh, criminology of surveillance as well and the ways in which we can see people just through their faces and the ways in which we capture people's identities. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will stop sharing. Um, are there any questions? Any thoughts, any comments? Any ideas you wanna workshop? You can um, unmute yourself if you like, um, or you can put it in the, put your question or comment in the chat. Um, I do encourage you to go to our website, camhunters.org. Um, so if you're interested, for example, in that um, statement, you're welcome to um, download it and use it. Um, and we also have some more you know, information on there in our um, podcast. Is there a specific, so this is from Stephanie, is there a specific type of flashlight you need to locate a camera? Can I use the flash on my phone? Yeah. Um, some of the articles we've read have, you know, said just use your your camera. You know, there's a flashlight function on most phones now. Um, you can just shine them into um, spaces, and if you see a kind of reflection back, it could it could be a camera lens. <laughs> You're very welcome. Any other questions? I think one question that we always get is like, is this actually happening? And it is happening. And I think that a lot of the examples that Julia and I found are actually within Toronto or in Ontario. And I think we often think about these things happening elsewhere or outside of Canada or um, just in bigger cities. But to know that it's so close to home is is really scary to me. Yeah, I have to say that, um, well, Steffi knows, um, my research has made me very paranoid. <laughs> any other questions? Oh, on that note, from Stephanie again, I am from Scotland. Do you have any data reflecting this happening there? Hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, as far as I know, to be honest with you, there haven't been any studies, like sort of empirical studies, looking at the, the sort of rate of incidence of this kind of thing. Um, but I mean, you know, the fact is, is that there is, you know, it's very easy to get um, surveillance equipment, like very small cameras, and, um, you know, you can order them on Amazon. So, I mean, it is, you know, something that can happen, I think has happened in many places. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's important to think about, like, these questions, these things like this um, happening, bring up questions of, you know, what is privacy, um, questions of why, why do certain um, aspects of our, why are certain aspects of our lives considered more private than others? Um, and or, you know, why is there, um, why are we afraid to be seen? So for example, like in my research on image-based sexual abuse, some scholars have asked, why are we um, afraid to be seen in a sexual light? Like, why is that considered so shameful? Um, so, you know, separate from the question of, you know, having, you know, your privacy um, breached or, um, or someone betray your trust is the question of why is it, why is it so awful to be seen sexually? Or why is it so awful to be seen on the toilet? You know, these are um, kind of social, um, social standards, I guess, that we've set for ourselves um, and that, that are, you know, in theory, at least um, changeable, right? We don't have to, um, we don't have to all uh, agree that it is shameful to be seen sexually, for example. Um, anyway, I went on a bit of a tangent, but. Uh... I think there's also a conundrum that's currently happening specifically in Airbnbs where in the video, we didn't talk much about this, but in the video that we showed at the beginning, there's this interesting, Julia actually talked briefly about how the fact that Airbnb says that you can have cameras in Airbnbs as long as you're upfront about it, which is mimicking the urban expectation of if you have cameras in your store or something, there needs to be a sign. That's, that's just legal within Canada. Um, but the conundrum is that then we think about 
is the privacy of the user who is pay or not the user, sorry, but the person who's paying to use that, that renter paying for the Airbnb, is that, you know, more important than the person, the host who's installing a camera because they actually feel uh, there's a threat because of their property being stolen or damaged. And that's very different than putting a camera and not saying anything for voyeuristic or um, like the more creepy reasons. So there's this kind of uncertainty of how to, to navigate those. And I think a lot of us would say, well, obviously don't put a camera because the people who are paying to be in that space are should be paying for privacy. But in the same argument, Airbnb places eventually, I guess, kind of become this public space. It's like a semi-private, semi-public space because it's a business at the same point and it's somebody's home. So there's no clear outline of what that looks like internationally at this point. We have a question from Shanice. Okay, I'll, I can read it out loud. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm excited to listen to the other podcast episodes. I come from Concordia University and hold a master's degree in media studies. My thesis explored heritage and kinship through research creation. When I saw this event, I was excited by the possibility of spaces to have conversations around research creation as a methodology at Carleton University. Are there spaces where I can, where these conversations are taking place that I can join? That's amazing. Thank you, Shanice. Uh, that's a great question because I, as uh, Dr. O'Neill has said, I am currently in the stages of creating a research creation hub uh, called ProtoHive. Uh, so it would be an Institute of Research Creation for Canada. So one of the things that you probably are feeling is that there are so many centers for research creation across Canada, and there's no one space to come together and talk about it because the projects that are happening are always basically attached to some very specific theoretical component. So my goal with this project is to have a hub in Canada where all of these institutes, all of these students can come together, have these conversations and uh, share resources like funding applications and even share uh, examples or qu ask questions about things that perhaps are limited in research creation right now. So there's not one complete definition that has been shared across all institutions. So there will be a space at Carleton. Uh, I've currently I'm just waiting on notification from a shirt grant, but regardless of that happening, I will be at least starting things virtually in the next by the, the, the summer. So there will be a website up that will have a space to ask questions. The goal of the shirt grant was to have uh, a symposium to have people come in so we can change some policies at the shirt level and the Canada Council level and such and uh, start creating these networks because I would love for there to be a place where we can all discuss. The second thing, and I wanna be really, I just wanna be quick about this so that we can get to other questions, but uh, I've been hosting annual roundtables at the University Art Association of Canada. So UAC research or UAC art history conference, and they've been research creation based. And this is where the idea of ProtoHive has come out of because we don't have a space to talk for longer than a couple hours annually. So uh, if you want, I'm usually going to be there and I would encourage you to participate and apply to, uh, to speak there and to engage with us at that capacity. And then hopefully I can share some information with you about the Carleton hub in the next uh, couple months. Stephanie's question is, sorry if this was answered already, but if you find a camera that was not disclosed, what should you do next? Leave the rental, confront the landlord, hide and unplug the cameras, call the authorities, a combination of some of these. Right, so um, Airbnb does have some policies up on their website, which you can you know, read ahead of time. Um, again, I don't know that there is any kind of one way of going about it. And it, it kind of depends, I guess, on what, where you found the camera and um, that kind of thing and, and what jurisdiction you're in. So for example, in some jurisdictions, it may be illegal to, for someone to hide a camera in a bathroom and not tell you. Um, so, I mean, some people have called the authorities. Um, you might also check to see if um, in the rental 
agreement, however it works on Airbnb. I haven't used it in so long, I can't remember whether or not that camera was already disclosed. So for example, if there was a camera in the living room, for example, and you didn't know that it was there, you might check to see, did they disclose it? And you just didn't know. Um, some people have, um, yeah, left the rental, contacted Airbnb and said, I want another rental. Um, uh, I think if, if you suspect that it is a, a, a criminal case that you probably don't want to unplug the cameras or touch them, you would just want to call the authorities, maybe take a photograph of it. I, again, I, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> I'm not giving you any legal advice here. Um, but yeah, I, I, all of those ideas are things that people have done. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> I think essentially whatever to, you, makes you feel safe in that capacity. Uh, I don't think there's right or wrong answers. Uh, I think as Julia has alluded, there's been so many different ways in which it's happened. Uh, we've also seen cases, I believe it was, is it in Australia? There was a person who found uh, like a ton, like a dozen cameras in his Airbnb. And he basically just documented him finding them and then posted it. And I think it went viral or something. Like he documented the cameras he found. Oh, I think oh. that if you can document it, whatever to make you feel as safe as possible, definitely call the authorities. Uh, one of the things I find so outrageous, and Julia mentioned this at the beginning, is that one of the suggestions that we keep finding in the media is to hire a professional investigator to check your Airbnbs before. I think one of the things that Cam Hunters has been striving to do is try to think about not only the safest, but the most economical way of, of doing this work, because I, I get the sense that if you're renting out an Airbnb, you probably don't have money or the extra funds to hire an investigator to come check out your Airbnb, especially if it's overseas or something. It just seems uh, absurd to me that that is a recommendation, but I mean, maybe people have that access. I definitely do not have that access. <laughs> so just being aware of the media and checking out what is going on. I think the example that we gave about looking for if the, it's happened remotely or around your community is really important because one of the things that we're seeing with the market of the, the current market with housing is that a lot of hosts actually own more than one property. So they don't just own one anymore. And sometimes it's not their house, it's their rental unit. Uh, sometimes they have multiple rooms in one house. So just being aware of looking at what's happening around, around these cases. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to be fair to Airbnb, uh, I think you know it's not, um, it's not necessarily something that only happens in Airbnbs, like this could happen technically anywhere. Um, you know, they're, they're in South Korea, for example, there was a, a has been an ongoing problem with uh, spy cameras in you know public washrooms and things like that. Um, so it's not you know it's not just an Airbnb issue. It is kind of a, a larger question of how you know the the availability of surveillance technologies and um, you know unethical uses of them. One of the things that we talk about in one of the podcast episodes, and the title of it is "Check the Lamps," is uh, this rise of accessible surveillance technologies that look like mundane objects and how it's becoming increasingly easy for people to buy them for their homes for whatever purpose, either it's for Airbnb or just for their general protection. And uh, one of the examples that Julia gives is this lamp from Samsung. Is it Samsung? I think it's Panasonic. It's, it's a large company. It's a large company, yeah. And it looks like just a regular lamp with a camera in it and it's just if you google surveillance technologies or if you just go on amazon and say like surveillance cameras for home the amount of cameras in everyday objects that you can now purchase is incredible so it's like check everything because you have no idea that lamp is very deceiving <laughs> um Yes, it's um, it's very odd um, camera camera adjacent um, products on the market that we've discovered in our research. <laughs> and this is very different a different conversation than smart technology and smart cities and how people are now buying smart technologies for their home for their own you know usage. Um, 
one of the things that I've seen lately. It's the Samsung refrigerator. Uh, it has this massive screen on it that's like bigger than an iPad and you can do whatever you want and talk to it and stuff. And um, that can end up good. What is the screen for? Like, it's just an internet connection? Yeah, it's basically, it kind of you can download I'm... apps and stuff. You can browse the internet. You can ask it to put in reminders. You can pull up re recipes. Uh, we're currently looking, just a personal side note, we're actually looking for appliances because we're doing renovations and I spent like 15 minutes in Home Depot playing around with this, this huge, really fancy, and they're not cheap, uh, not. refrigerator. You can do everything with it. It's like people who put their iPads on their, we do this at home, like for recipes, we put iPads on our counter when we're doing recipes and stuff. Essentially, you don't need to do that anymore because it's all on your, you can watch TV and Netflix from your refrigerator. I guess I could kind of see the, that how that would be nice, but I don't know how much I'd be willing to pay for that. So I could just bring my iPad into the kitchen. Expensive. Yeah. And if it breaks, then you have, it's spent, you gotta spend a lot of money fixing it. Yeah. Anyway, that is neither here nor there. Any other questions, comments, suggestions? Anything you'd like us to cover in our podcast, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm going to put our email um, in the chat. And then you can ask us questions. Uh, you can check out our website. I've also put that on in the chat, but I'm going to put it up again. And you can follow us on Instagram at Cam Hunters. And uh, yeah, check out the podcast. It's uh, it's on Apple Podcasts, but also on SoundCloud. We're going to start it up again for season two. And uh, if you have any suggestions or anything you would like, uh, any resources, articles, just reach out. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for coming and for your questions and your attention. And um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for being here.